Found Guilty by Josiah Flint Willard and Alfred Hodder. Among the graver misfortunes in the underworld is that of being in the right in a contest with the powers that rule. When a man adds to this misfortune the sheer folly of pressing his rights offensively, the gods have abandoned him. The gods had abandoned Howard Slifer even in the hour of his triumph. From the first his humiliation was a certainty. The precise time and manner of it only were left to doubt. Howard Slifer was a gentleman of the underworld who allowed it to be generally known that anyone who asked him for a fight would get it. A sensitive recognition of the claims of other people and an austere respect for them does not belong to the point of honor in the underworld. The point of honor in the underworld is for the most part concerned with a man's sensitive recognition of his own claims and his determination to have other people austerely respect them. And Howard Slifer was punctiliously honorable. He was possessed of considerable sums of ready money, kept with some trifling exceptions in strong boxes, the formula for opening which invariably included a drill and a bit of dynamite. The trifling exceptions were small matters of loose coin and broken rolls of banknotes which people of fortune, who had had no previous acquaintance with Mr. Slifer, stood and delivered to him at sight and on demand and by a solecism in their business habits asked no quittance or receipt. His physique was a patent of nobility in which all who stood might read a power to levy taxes and to assume possession of his personal estate wherever he might find it. He was of the build that led men to follow him with their eyes and to speculate upon the amount of punishment he could take and could inflict, and while they speculated they respected him greatly him and his manservant, and his maidservant, his ox and his ass, and everything that was his. Captain Brigstock of the precinct was not a man, he was a deputy divinity, and respected nothing except the arch-deputies, his official superiors. Technically there were sharp limitations to his constitutional powers over mere mortals, but in practice technical distinctions so seldom obtruded themselves upon his notice that his sense of them was apt to become quite vague. What the precise occasion was of his entering Mr. Slifer's domicile, nobody in the outer world ever plucked up courage to ask him. When Slifer was asked, he said that the captain had dropped in unofficially on uh, private business, and added no comment beyond a malign grin. There was an impression in the outer world that the captain had made his visit expressly at a time when he knew Mr. Slifer was not at home, and that Mr. Slifer had returned unexpectedly. What was certain is that the captain made his exit from the Slifer domicile in unconventional haste, and that no mention of the incident was ever made in the public prints. He had reached the street from a second-story window, through which he had backed with such violence as to bring away the sash. This was the hour of the haughty Slifer's triumph, and the hour when the gods abandoned him. Three weeks afterward there occurred a manifestation of esprit de corps among the powers that rule, which it was not pleasant to contemplate. Patrolman Hooper, of Captain Brigstock's precinct, had been murdered overnight while on duty, and not only in Brigstock's precinct, but throughout the city the force was of one mind. It was not only that if an officer on duty is not safe, not a man of them was safe. There was an element of insult and effrontery in an attack upon a patrolman that stirred something more in his associates than personal fear. It touched their corporate pride. "'Somebody's got to croak for this,' Detective Swinton declared sententiously to a group of his brother sleuths. "'I don't care if Hooper was only a flatty.' He was a copper, and we fly cops have got to send some bloke to the chair for busting him. There's a push of guns in this town that thinks flatties don't count. That there won't be much of a kick when one of them's keeled over. And they'll crook some of us fly cops before long if we don't learn them a lesson. It was a great bull somebody wasn't croaked for the killing of Patrolman Stimson two years ago. Stimson was a fool right enough to go up against the gang that did him. But if one of them had croaked for basting him, Hooper'd be alive now. 
I tell you, guns are just like kids when it comes to learning them anything. If they see it, you mean business, they'll crawl. But if you monkey with them, they'll throw you down. There's some that thinks that guns will act on the level with coppers, whether they got to or not. That's damn rot. Of course, there's some squarer than others, but I've known all kinds for twenty-five years, and I'd give it to you straight that they ain't built to like us. They got the same class feeling we have, and if we don't croak one of them for doing Hooper, they'll get so nervy that coppers will be dropping in their tracks every month. They got to be called down. The law for the powers that prey is that it is better ninety-nine guilty men should escape than that one innocent man should suffer. The law for the powers that rule is that an example must be made. The powers that prey must suffer as a clan for an offense against the powers that rule. The clan must give up its offending member or must stand in terror and uncertainty of where precisely the hand of the force will strike. That it will strike somewhere there must not be the slightest doubt. The orders of Captain Brigstock were laconic and smacked of his divine authority. He recognized no impossibility in the case. He spoke with the accent of omnipotence. He said simply, Find him. I don't want to hear a word about difficulties. Damn the difficulties. I want him found. There were, for the moment, but the slightest indications to go upon. Hooper must have been struck from behind, must have turned upon his assailant, and in the scuffle lost his helmet. At least he had been stabbed twice in the back, and had received a heavy downward blow in the temple, from which his helmet would have saved him. The mainspring of his watch had been broken, and the hands marked five minutes past four, thus determining almost with exactness the moment when he was assaulted. His assailant had been hurt, and could be traced by blood stains to a sheltered doorway half a block distant, where he had seemingly bound up his wounds and changed his clothes. A hundred other details were reported, but for three days these remained, in spite of the command of deputed omnipotence, the only ones that were significant. Then came a statement that a short time before his death, Patrolman Hooper had a difficulty with Howard Slifer, and that high words had been exchanged. It is said that Slifer attempted to break away when he found himself safe within the walls of the station house in the precinct. He was, at all events, soundly clubbed before he was locked in his cell. The blows given were accurately measured according to his power for taking punishment. It may be doubted whether Captain Brigstock had been more thoroughly bruised when he measured his length in the street. It is, perhaps, a chance coincidence that the captain was present while Slifer was being taught the power of the law. The evidence against the prisoner was worked up with systematic vigor. The negative evidence especially was significant. It could not be discovered that at the time Patrolman Hooper was struck down, the prisoner was not near at hand. Patrolman Gundy, in a misguided moment, opined that almost at the precise time of the murder, he had seen the prisoner enter a house a dozen blocks distant from the scene of the affair. The outburst of disapproval with which this statement was received made Patrolman Gundy uncertain first about the precise time, then about the precise man, and finally about whether or not he had seen anyone. Patrolman Connard opined that a quarter to five he had passed a man who might be the prisoner within a block of the scene of the affair. The captain asked him what, in the name of things unprintable, his glims were for and told him point-blank that anyone not an ass could say whether a man that he had passed was the prisoner or not, and Patrolman Connard became certain that he was not an ass, and certain that he had passed the prisoner, and not at all certain that the hour was a quarter to five, or a quarter to four, or to three. A safe had been blown open in the building immediately in front of which Patrolman Hooper's body was found and the prisoner's method of collecting the living that the world owed him was well known. There were a number of other people who employed the same method, but that is a detail. The abandoned clothes were much too short in the arms and legs for the prisoner, and much too small to have been drawn on over a second suit, but clad in his underclothing only, it was just possible he could squeeze into them, and the less perfectly they fitted him, the better the disguise. 
and at the time he was stripped and examined in his cell, he had so many recent wounds that the only difficulty was to decide which of them his captors had not given him. The indictment before the grand jury was secured by evidence which, as the newspaper said, was so overwhelmingly convincing that murder in the first degree was the only charge permissible. The district attorney publicly complimented the police on their handling of the case, and declared that never before during his activity as public prosecutor had he known of a murderer who was not actually seen committing the crime being brought to the bar of justice with proof of guilt so thoroughly established and ably presented. In an interview with a representative of the press, he said, Captain Brigstock's men have not only avenged the murder of their brother officer, they have demonstrated afresh the remarkable ability of the city's police force. It is no light matter to protect a city as large as ours, which in the very nature of things becomes a Mecca and Medina for criminals, and it is gratifying to know that our safety is looked after by so conscientious a band of officers. The patrolman ordered before the grand jury not only distinctly remembered seeing Slifer in the near neighborhood of the scene of the crime soon after it was committed, but they produced the weapon with which Hooper had been struck down, and showed the jury several rolls of bills taken from Slifer's pockets, which there was no doubt were part of the plunder he had secured in the safe robbery. Free to indulge his imagination as to how the struggle between Hooper and Slifer took place, the prosecuting attorney portrayed the villain, discovered by the virtuous Hooper, in the act of blowing open the safe, or in the act of endeavoring to escape, no matter which. The intellectual and wholly impatient jury, who had business of their own, which they were not attending to, saw in their mind's eye the prosecuting attorney's vivid picture, saw the villain Slifer blow open the safe, saw him make his escape, saw the devoted Hooper, attempt to arrest him, saw the struggle, the blows, the gleam of the knife. Finally, they saw in private, with eyes not of the mind, Slifer's mishandled body. To add force to these specific arguments, Slifer's record, both as Peterman and convict, was produced, and he was declared to be one of the most desperate offenders in the country. There was nothing for the intellectual and wholly impatient jury to do but indict him, and he was bound over till the next term of court. 2. Francis Peary and James Schell were two travelers of the underworld who had just returned from Europe to secure fresh letters of credit. They had made the fashionable grand tour of the continent, had blown themselves at the Monte Carlo crib, had seen wonderful things in forbidden Paris, and had come back to God's country to attend to business until their bank accounts should permit of another trip abroad. Shell had suggested while they were in Paris that they recoup their fortunes on the spot and avoid the seasickness and miscellaneous locomotion, but Peary's counsel had prevailed and they arrived in God's country about three weeks previous to the murder of Patrolman Hooper. "'There's dough on this side, all right.' Peary admitted, in reply to Shell's suggestion that they establish themselves in the French capital. But it ain't our kind of dough. I've been rubbering around pretty strong since I've been on this side, and I'm next to how the money market stands over here. You remember that fellow from Vienna to borrow the hundred from in Rome, and how he kept telling me to be sure and return it by the time I said I would? <laughs> well, he shows up the whole business. He was a nice enough bloke, and had the rocks and all that. But he ain't the kind of bloke that lets you and me live and take trips abroad. When he figures up his accounts at the end of the year, everything must balance. He'll have a whole string of items just called men ain't made of wood. But he knows where them contributions went, see? Well, it's the same all over Europe. They all got to know where and how the dough went and who got it what they got it for. It had kill them to figure up one of the columns in their account books and have to write after it, go on and damn me if I know where. They got dough, but they ain't got no dough to lose without making a hell of a beef about it. See what they did with Bidwell when he made that Bank of England touch in the early 70s. Give him life? Hmm? 
Why, them Englishmen thinks money is something sacred, holy, religious-like. I gamble a thousand that old bank could be touched up again for a million or two, but they'd hang the bloke that done it. It's not like that on the other side. Every year there's just so much dough lying around loose to be swiped, and if it ain't swiped, it's put down in the profit column. It's the same kind of dough that's looking for circulation in poker games. It wants to keep moving and changing hands, and guns is there to give it rope, see? It's a kind of providence. And the copper's in there to make the guns trouble, retorted Shell. It's all right about the loose dough, but what about the loose fly cops? I'd rather take my chance with ten of them rube coppers here in Paris than with one of their fly elbows in New York. Ah, everybody's a copper on this side, urged Peary. You remember that gun in Berlin trying to make a getaway after he picked the mall's pocket and how the whole street sprinted after him? <laughs> That's the way they do things on this side. The crowd is in sympathy with the copper and not with the gun. In the States, they give a gun a running chance and let the copper do the chasing. That's the way it ought to be. The morning of the day following the murder of Patrolman Hooper, two men were in earnest conversation in a gaudily furnished room in an uptown hotel. One lay on the bed with a bandage around his head, and from the blood stains on the clothes it was evident that he was nursing a wound. The other sat at the bedside. The two were registered on the hotel's books as coming from Sydney, Australia, and had signed the names Richard Womperson and Jackson Mather. You put his light out all right, the man at the bedside remarked. They picked him up croaked. Mm, Serves the doctor right, mumbled the invalid. Anybody been copped out yet? The pipers say, just listen to my foreign education, that the police have pinched that Michigan bloke, Slifer. We done a bit with him in Cherry Hill eight years back, remember? The bloke that made old Brigstock take that quick sneak out of his flat one day. They're going to railroad him for fair. The world says the police found the weapon on him and the journal claims to had some of the bank's dough in his pockets. Them newspapers is getting real wise. What a lot they do know. Seems like a gun can't do nothing anymore without being pinched for something else. This comment was certainly ungrateful, the invalid not having been pinched of late for anything. More than that, it was unintelligent. The invalid did not understand the arrangement of things that makes imaginative news columns indispensable. I'd sooner be pinched for what I didn't do than what I'd done. It riles a bloke's sense of justice to be accused false and helps him put up a front, declared the other. But you kicked in Paris about everybody being a copper in Europe and a gun having no chance. What do you call the newspapers in this country but coppers? Fly ones, ain't they? They ain't copped out you and me. They're dead as the stiffs in the front office. They say Slifer got away with the full 50,000 because they only found a few rolls on him. They're smart, they are. <laughs> they think he's made a plant somewhere. Shows you how dead they are. They know about as much who cop that coin as Slifer does. Of course, the police have got to put up a bluff, and i glad to pinch anybody. But you'd think them papers might take a tumble to themselves once in a while. Good for us that we wasn't mugged that time that old Freckleton got his glimpse on us three years ago, ain't it? Longer than that. And besides, old Freck's croaked. He's the only man on the force who knew us. Oh, I ain't leery, I ain't. Uh, but it's pie to take a constitutional without everybody rubbering. Say, I guess I uh, take a bit of a leg loosener and see about bagging that dough in uh, London. That's where we need it in our business, and the sooner we get it there, the quicker. We want to mooch soon as we can stand for the ante. All right, but don't be long I'm dead to the world up here alone. So long. So long. The night of the beginning of the eighth week after the murder of Patrolman Hooper, Francis Perry and James Shell were sitting at whiskey in a fashionable midnight resort on Sixth Avenue. Perry should have been at home and in bed. Almost any layman could have told him that he was gravely ill. He was a dime-novel specter, 
and the flesh had drawn back on his bones till they began to stand out in sharp angles. The inference of an outsider would have been that he was another of the victims which the life in fashionable midnight resorts sometimes demands, but inferences made by outsiders show their wit and not their knowledge. The only person present who really knew what was what was James Shell, but he would not have admitted this even to Peary. There was a look of disgust in his face while he watched the sick man reach feebly for his glass. "'It's a wonder you wouldn't take a bracer. You've been belly aching around these joints for the last two months, and I'm getting tired of looking at you. I want to mooch to the other side. Anyone would think that the copper had hit you with a baseball bat the way you play the baby act. He just give you a love tap with his mace, that's all. A couple of love taps like that had put out of my light then and there, Peary answered wearily. I'm a sick man, Shell. Sick nothing. Why the devil don't you stay at home if you're sick? You've been following me about for the last eight weeks like a cur pup. I never asked you to. Stay to home and nurse yourself if you're so knocked up. I'm agreeable. I'm getting bully tired of hearing you whine. You don't need to be afraid of me. I ain't going to knock against you. Nobody will ever find out from me that you and that flatty couldn't hit it off together. I can keep as dead about uh, that as you can. And I ain't going to do you out of the dough either. You'll get all that's coming to you when we get to London. It's banked there and half of it is yours. But I give it to you straight. I'm going to give you the chilly mitt if you don't stop dogging me round all these joints. You give me the chilly mitt? Peary sat upright in his chair with an obvious effort. The hand of death was upon the man, really, but he had his grit with him. That's what I said. You're all right when you want to be, but I won't stand for any more of this shadowing me about, see? What I think is your bug house. Merely to acknowledge that he was sick was a confession which, in the circumstances, it had cost Peary more than Shell realized to make. To sit at a table with a man whom he had looked upon as his pal and hear that he was Bughouse was a challenge which even his weakened state could not keep from accepting. Take her, you duffer! He hissed between his teeth and threw his beer glass with all his might at Shell's head. The fight was over before the attendants could interfere. Shell tried to throw Peary to the floor, and Peary sent a bullet through his heart. His light went out without a flicker. Three. A man lay dying in the hospital ward of prison. Captain Brigstock, of precinct, sat beside his couch. Get through the croak all right, ain't I? Raise me up a bit, Cap. Thanks. That's what they call it, Perry. Well, Cap, I, I might as well tell you now as later. You got the wrong bloke in that Hooper business. Slifer didn't do Hooper. Give me some more of that dope there, quick. I, uh, I'm dying. Oh, it's a dirty job to die. Uh, me, too, I die bad. That's why I'm telling you. A stimulant revived him for a moment. Say, he kept me in the shell. Are you listening? Put it on paper, Blucky. I'm getting kind of weak in my tubes. Got the pencil there. Uh, me and, and Shell, we croaked, getting it down, we we croaked Hooper, me in front with a billy when his helmet dropped off, and him behind with a knife, that stuff in the papers was rot, uh, and Shell, I put his light out, damn it, he tried to do me out of the dough, that's why I'm here, see? His mind was wandering. Brigstock's pencil paused, and Brigstock himself took it for a sign of some special care of providence for him that Peary's confession had been made to no one else. What kind of providence would naturally choose him out to care for, and whether in highest heaven or deepest the other place, he had not leisure at the moment to inquire. "'Where's the dough planted?' he asked. The sick man's eyelids fluttered open, but with no recognition of Captain Brigstock or of his question. There was a great light of anger and pain in the eyes, and the lips drew back from the strong, discolored teeth. You give me the chilly mitt, he almost shouted, half rising in bed. Take that, you duffer. 
and he flung himself bodily on Captain Brigstock. It was quite true. Peary died bad. That evening, Brigstock, in his lodgings, meditated afresh on the special care of Providence. At the end of his meditations, which he had assisted by striding up and down the room, he knelt by the open fire and tore out and burned certain leaves from his notebook. The night of New Year's Day, some ten months after the murder of Patrolman Hooper, Howard Slifer sat in his cell in prison and talked through the bars of the cell door with his death watch. The evidence given at the time of his indictment had been repeated with additions at the time of his trial, and among those additions, the confession of Francis Peary was not found. "'You hear what I'm telling you, Jackson,' Slifer said that night. I ain't turning soft and kicking about going to the chair, not me. It's up to me to sit in it that straight. And I've done enough to deserve croaking ten times over. But Jackson, it ain't up to me to stand for the killing of Hooper. I didn't do it. Of course, the evidence don't look that way, and they think that they've got me dead to rights, but that just shows how bug house some of the things in this world are. Jackson... If Hooper could get up out of his grave now, he'd say, Slifer didn't do it. I don't mind croaking for anything I done, but I hate like hell to croak for something I didn't. End of Found Guilty by Josiah Flint Willard and Alfred Hodder.